speaker. Uh, and our next speaker, I'm very excited that he is joining us. Uh, this is today we're going to pop his cherry in a, in a way because he's not given uh, a talk like this to a hardcore phenomics audience. So Stanley Picard is a professor and group head uh, of the Terrestrial Invertebrate Research Group at the Department of Botany and Zoology at uh, Masaryk University in Brno in the Czech Republic, which I hope I pronounced more or less correctly. Yes. Um, Stano is almost offensively productive. Uh, if you're just interested in what he and his lab do, then uh, you will spend many weeks reading. Uh, so I've only dipped into his body of work myself a little bit. Uh, so I'm extremely excited that he's here today. He is excited most of all about uh, spiders, especially how spiders interact with their prey. And I think that will be the topic of today's lecture, uh, which is titled Phenomic Adaptations of Prey Specialized Spiders. Uh, Sano, welcome here. Thanks for joining us and uh, you're free to talk. Thank you, Ronald. First, thank you for the invitation and thank you for, for uh, introducing me. I have to share my screen. So uh, I hope that you can see the presentation. Can you? Yep, I can indeed. It's good. Perfect. So, um, as Ronald said, this topic will be slightly different from what you heard so far, because I'm not going to focus on the molecules, but on the whole organisms. And uh, in this talk, I would like to summarize the research that we have performed over the last, uh, uh, basically, like uh, almost 10 years, but uh, most of the results has been already published. So, I will focus on spiders and on a specific group of spiders, which are specialized on a certain prey. So uh, not, I'm not sure if how familiar you are with spiders, but spiders are actually uh, with more than 50,000 species, the most di divert, diversified terrestrial predators. And the uh, uh, ma majority of spiders are actually generalists with every phagos. That means that they catch different types of prey. You know that spiders are true predators, which means that actually they catch prey from the very early stage, from the juvenile stage, of the first instar up to the adulthood. And this can last for, let's say, one year. So every single individual of a spider will capture uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of prey items during his life cycle. Um, the journalists are using uh, various uh, strategies to catch prey, but are more fascinated by the spiders which are specialized on a certain type of prey. And these are spiders are quite rare. I mean, uh, it's only, but we estimated that it's only about like 10% of spiders which are probably specialized. Maybe even less, but uh, the knowledge or the evidence that we have points to about 10%. Uh, spiders have specialized on six or five or six types of prey, mainly on ants, and then also on termites, other spiders, crustaceans, such as isopods, moths, and dipterans. These are very different types of prey. Some of them are social, such as ants or termites. Others are completely solitary, like spiders or crustaceans or moths. And actually, three types of these, and namely the ants, termites, are, termites and spiders, are so-called dangerous prey. And this is because they, most of the species of each of these group can have some type of a defense. For example, the ants can not only sting and bite, but also can perform a communal attack on a spider. Uh, similarly, termites, actually, at least some of the cast can do so. And other spiders also represent the dangerous prey because they have other weapons, such as the venom or the silk. Um, spiders overall uh, can use either silk or venom to immobilize prey. And actually, uh, some spiders, for example, those that build webs, first apply the silk to restrain the uh, mobility of the prey, and then use venom to kill it or to completely immobilize it. Other spiders can use only venom or they can use a both combination. So typically we classify spiders as so-called web builders or encursorial. So the web builders are the ones which mainly use the, the web, which is composed of silk, to restrain the prey, while the cursorial mainly use the venom. Uh, our review have actually shown that most of the specialists are actually among cursorial species. Now I will show you a video of a species which is actually specialized on ants and which use, is using both the silk and venom. So this is a tiny 
pteridid spider, you can see it here in front, which first apply the silk to restrain the appendages of the ant, mainly the antenna and also the legs. And so the, the silk is very sticky. So the, the ant, the prey is not able to, to move. And then the spider, as you can see now, apply a bite to some part of a head typically. And by this means he will inject the venom to the prey and it will take about a few minutes, let's say five to five to ten minutes, that the prey is completely immobilized. And during this time, the spider waits at a distance, connected with a silk that transmits the vibration, so he can identify whether the prey is still alive or dead. And then the spider returns back to bundle the prey into more silk. So these spiders use silk not only before the prey capture, but also during the prey capture or after the immobilization. And the silk is then used to carry the prey away to uh, some secret place where he can consume the whole prey. Okay, so this, this species, the Europees, uses first the silk and then the venom to completely immobilize the prey. And in our group, uh, we are looking for the adaptations that the spiders use for the prey capture. So generally, we can classify the trophic adaptations into four different groups. This can be morphological adaptations, such as, for example, the shape of Calicera, which we can see in several, for example, these there are species which have elongated Calicera or slightly curved and so on. Or this can be a very thick cuticle, which uh, works as an armor against other, uh, against dangerous prey. Then we have some behavioral adaptations, which include the mode of attack, as you could see in this every of the spider in the former video. And there are also metabolic adaptations, uh, which is basically a combination of enzymes which are used to di digest the tissue, because we have shown that actually specialized are only able to extract nutrients only from their preferred prey, and they are not able to, able to develop on alternative prey. And finally, we also can define the venomic adaptations, uh, which means that they, this is some effective venom composition that is used to uh, immobilize the prey. Uh, these adaptations can have different specificity. And in general, we recognize that in generalist and europhagal species, these adaptations are very general. That means they are applicable for different types of prey. For example, the enzymes are so diverse that they can, the spiders could digest any kind of prey almost, except that it's uh, poisonous. And, but in specialists, the adaptations are very specialized. That means restricted only to be effective against a certain type of prey. Uh, now I'll focus more on the venomic adaptations because that's the main topic of this, uh, this talk. And as you may know, maybe better than me, the venom is composed or it's a basically a cocktail of many biological substances. In fact, in spiders, uh, this, this, this range includes a simple, a simple ions through peptides to large molecules. And in a single species, there can be hundreds or, or, or several hundreds of the, of the molecules or, and several toxins. So as venomic adaptations, we consider actually two measurable variables. And first one is the amount of venom, because we know that the spiders can regulate amount of venom at injection. And some spiders can actually typically use more venom to envenomate the prey, while others can use only very little amount of venom. So the, the amount of venom glands is actually highly variable. And then the venom composition, that means the uh, composition in the, in the chemical substances that the venom contains. And this is probably a result of natural selection. And this could, in prey specialized spiders, be most, li most likely the result of the selection uh, from the prey that they catch. So um, in the first study, our aim was a comparative analysis of venom volume and its composition in a species that uh, represent a various trophic strategies. And uh, we use both the specialist and the generalist spiders. And we know already from our former research that generalists catch prey more frequently than specialists. For example, uh, generalists typically catch prey every three days, depending on the temperature, of course, and the uh, stage of development. But on average, it's like three days. While specialists would catch prey only once a week or one in two weeks. So it's a very long time period in between. 
then we also know that the specialist does not catch all type of prey. Uh, we, many spider specialists catch only the preferred prey and they are adapted to such prey in such an ex extent they would not even aim to catch an alternative prey and they would basically die. This is the case of many ant-eating spiders which only recognize ants as they prey and they would reject any other prey and they would basically die of, of, of uh, starvation. So in this case, or in this study, our hypothesis was that the specialist should possess smaller glands with less complex venom composition when compared to the generalists. Uh, for this study, we have used 40 different species. Uh, here you see the cladogram of the, of the uh, phylogenetic relationship. You basically can see that they come from 30 to genera and 15 families. And this is basically including all modern spider species, uh, or at least the major from major clades. There are no mygalomorphs, that means the primitive species, because among mygalomorphs, there are no specialists at all. Some of the species which are marked here in a, with a white circle are the generalists. The ones with a gray circle are so-called uh, facultative specialists. And the ones with the black circle here are the obligatory specialists. The distinction between the facultative and obligatory specialists is the one that the obligatory specialists feed nothing else but one prey type, while the facultative specialists can catch even alternative prey, though they usually prefer some prey type. In uh, most great majority of the species is using mainly venom to catch the prey, but few of them, which are here assigned with this index S, are the ones which can also use silk, as you could see in that uh, first video. As for the methods, well, as I said, we have classified each of these species into three traffic groups, the generalists, the facultative specialists, and obligatory specialists. And then in a number of individuals, typically between three and, and seven, we decide this, dissected the glands, and measure their volume. And then we perform two analyses concerning the composition. First of all, the SDSS page gel electrophoresis for the, for the large molecules. That means between the 10 and 250 kilodaltons. And then multitof uh, for the small molecules or peptides. That means two to 15 kilodaltons. Uh, we have completely omitted the smaller molecules like the ions. And here are the results. So when we look at the gland size, oops, I'm sorry, I should go back. Uh, so the venom, uh, the venom gland, which is displayed in this figure, was much smaller in the obligatory specialists than in the facultative specialists and generalists. And this, this was uh, significantly different. Uh, when we also uh, compared the size of glands in species which use silk, we didn't find any significant difference. That means the use of silk was independent of the use of venom or the amount of venom. Then we looked at high molecular substances, which are uh, shown here in two figures. The first figure on the left shows the number of signals or bands actually in this case for these three groups. And we can clearly see that there is a significant difference in the number of sig signals in the generalists and obligatory specialists. The faculty specialists is, are somewhere in between. And a similar picture actually, actually is on the right figure, which compares the diversity of signals. This is the alpha diversity of the signals, where again, the generalists have much higher, significantly higher alpha diversity than the obligatory specialists. Then we look at the mo low molecular substances from the Malditov analysis. And again, we also look, we look at the number of signals and here we see a significant difference between the number of these sig uh, signals in the generalists and both facultative and obligatory specialists. And finally, we look at the number of dominant signals, which gave a similar picture. That means in generalists, it was significantly higher than in the facultative and obligatory specialists. In the last stage, we performed a, a multivariate analysis canonical correspondence analysis in order to detect whether there are any similarities in the composition separately for the high and low molecular substances between the generalists, obligatory specialists, and facultative specialists. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't find any, any significant difference in the, between the uh, high molecular substances, but we did found a significant difference in the low molecular substances. So we see that these are the 
uh, generalists and there are here on the right left uh, on the, or the right bottom faculty specialists and on the top the obligatory specialists and there are so they have some common molecules however we are not able to identify them so uh, then uh, we look we did another study which had a slightly similar aim which was a comparative analysis of capture efficiency using species which also have different uh, trophic adaptations and trophic specializations so we our aim is, was to look uh, how the different types of spiders can actually capture the prey and we know that specialists can only catch few prey types typically only one for example ants if they are ant specialists while generally generalists can catch different types of prey but typically with a with a similar efficiency so our hypothesis here was that the specialists are more effective in prey capture of preferred prey than the generalists and uh, so in this case we have used 22 species coming from 19 genera and seven families again here is the phylogenetic relationship all these species are coming from the those modern spiders that means the the ones which are uh, highly diversified and uh, but here with the uh, with the empty squares these are the generalists and the full circles are the specialists so as for the methods uh, we have used species specifically six species which i'm sorry have to go back six species which are uh, specialized on ants then three species which are specialized on spiders two species which are specialized on termites and we collected the spiders in the field so we have used natural occurring populations and in each species we have used approximately from 10 to 30 individuals and then we perform laboratory trials predation trials in which we have offered to each single individual two types of prey a preferred prey and then alternative prey uh, this was sometimes a difficult task because, like, as I said before, for example, ant eating specialists do typically or um, do typically only at attack ants, no other prey. So we have to uh, make some preliminary tries to see whether there is some prey, alternative prey they could attack. And indeed, we found so typically, for example, when we have used ant eating spiders, they were also able to accept termites or attack termites. For spider eating spiders. These are not so specialized, so they can also attack crickets. And for termite eating spiders, they were also very specialized, and there was no other prey that we could use, only larvae of fruit flies they, they would accept as an alternative prey, probably because they look similar. So let me show you another video. We chose the, uh, the hunting behavior of an ant eating Zodarian spider. The hunting behavior is very fast, so this has been recorded by a by a fast camera with 50 frames per second. So we can see that when the ant will jump or will basically get into close proximity with spider. Now spider bites into the hind leg, into the second leg, and then moves away very quickly because the ant would turn away and would kill him. Now you will see as the spider jumps away, the whole sequence takes only like 10 milliseconds. So that's why it has been shot by the high speed camera so that you can see the sequence. So let me show you the results. Uh, we have, as I said, we have you six species, but I will show you only figures for the two species because otherwise the other were quite similar. So the, the two species that I'm showing is Evriopis and Sodarion. And you can see from this figure that uh, the efficacy in capture, that means which is measured in the seconds that took into immobiliz immobilization, that means the latency to, to death, was much higher in specialists or much shorter in specialists than in the generalist, which is here by the dashed line. So the full line show the specialist. The alternative prey, however, show a different picture. Termites were attacked or were killed with much longer latency than in by the specialist than by the generalist. And a similar picture can be seen here. This is a Zodarion. Again, the Zodarion has uh, managed to kill ants with much shorter latency than termites, while the generalist of the genus Salamia has been has shown a very similar latency uh, to kill. Then I'll show you. Uh, we look at the Araneophagus spiders, that means spiders that feed on other spiders. 
And this is an example of a pulpy manus. I will show you again a, a video which has been shot by a high-speed camera. This is pulpy manus in the bottom of the screen, and this is the it's alternative prey. Uh, so the sp you see that when the spider approaches, the, sp the spider, a pulpy manus, catch, captures the prey by the leg, then injects the venom. And luckily, in this case, the prey was able to escape after amputating its leg. So by this means, it has saved its life. But this all never, this happens rather rarely. So pulpy manus is often very efficient in capturing prey. If you look at the results, they are slightly si similar. So against the paralysis latency or the latency to kill, for the specialist, which is here for pulpy manus and then lampona, was much shorter for the spider prey, the preferred prey, than for the alternative cricket prey. In the case of the generalist, it was almost similar both for the spider and cricket prey. And on the right figure shows a slightly different picture. Again, the lampona was much more uh, faster in killing spider than the cricket. But in this case, the, also the generalist, uh, Rasodes of, of a similar family, was also uh, short or has, uh, has killed the spider prey much quicker than the cricket. And finally, we look at the termitophagous spiders. I don't have a video here to show you. But in this case, I'll show you only one, fig one single figure for the Stenali rulus, which is a jumping spider from the South Africa. And as I said, we have used the termite as the preferred prey and the fruit fly larva as the alternative prey. So the specialist was uh, actually showed a similar efficiency against termites and fruit flies because the paralysis latency was short and similarly short for the both types of prey. But for the generalist, it took much longer but especially interestingly, the, the termites were actually killed with much shorter latency than fruit flies. So basically this shows that the general areas has high efficiency for termites as well. Um, and lastly, I would get to the third study in which we were interested into the, uh, the basically the, the role of the venom. So we conducted bioassays uh, with using venom, which has been extracted from araneophagos and myrmecophagos spiders. Uh, we know that the spiders can regulate the amount of venom which is injected. And we know that the, the experiments that we did before, we were not able to control for the amount of venom. So, the, the, so the, the latency that we have observed could be a result of, for example, larger amount of venom that has been injected. Even though we were able to control for the number of bites, we are not able to control for the amount of venom injected at a single bite. So uh, we work with the hypothesis that the venom of specialists is more potent to the preferred prey, as we have seen from the former studies. And for this purpose, we have used, we have focused on two spider specialists, the spider-eating spider of the genus Palpimanus, and then the ant-eating spider of the genus Darion. And as the counterparts or generalists, we compare the venom with the venom of Stegodyphus, and the venom of Sibiodamus. And we performed laboratory bioassays. That means we have extracted the venom and then we injected a specified uh, amount of venom into a single prey. And we used two types of prey, the preferred and alternative prey. And the results are summarized in these two figures. So um, here we see that this is the spider prey. So the first figure on the left shows the the, the results for the Araneophagus spider, the Palpimanus, where we offer the spider and the cricket prey. So we see that the LD50 dose has been much, much uh, about 100 times lower for almost 1,000 times lower for Palpimanus than uh, for uh, spider prey in case of Palpimanus than for the cricket. While in the case of generalist, the amount of uh, the, LD, the dose of the LD50 was quite similar for both type prey types. Similar picture was found for the Zodarion. Again, here we use the ant as a prey and cricket as an alternative prey. And we see that the dose at which the Zodarion venom was been able to kill 50% of the prey was very low compared to that of the generalist, which was about similar for both prey types. And in fact, we, were, uh, we used several different concentrations of the Zodarion venom. However, any of them was able to, to immobilize the alternative prey. So it seems that the venom is highly specific. So let me conclude. 
in these studies, we have shown that they generally possess more venom, which is functionally more diversified because they have to catch and process a variety of prey types during the life cycle. The obligatory specialists, which typically feed for the whole life cycle only in a single prey type, for example, even one single ant species, they possess less venom and they also have less complex profiles. Uh, we have shown also that the venom of specialists is more effective than that of the generalists. That means that the, uh, the paralysis latency was much shorter for the specialists than for the generalists, at least for the preferred prey. And we have also shown that the venom of specialists is actually ineffective against the alternative prey, even to such, a de such an extent that uh, the, the alternative prey would never die of the, after the injection of venom. And these actually, this type of venom uh, adaptations are, seems to be so effective that even this tiny Zodarion spider, juvenile of the first instar, is able with a single bite to kill this huge ant species. This, is a, this species actually occurs in, in the Negev Desert in Israel, where they hunt large uh, Mesoaranarium ants. So finally, let, just let me introduce you the team. This work has been made in collaboration with the uh, first of uh, collab collaborators from South Africa, as is Charles Haddad, then my postdoc, as is Seva Liznarova, Ondra Michalek, and Lenka Petrakova, and then the people from the proteomic group, as is Ondra Bochanek, and Ondra Shadu, and Phoenix Trao. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stano. That was excellent. That was very interesting. Uh, if you can unshare your screen, we yes, may be I will. able to field yes. some questions. Sure, I will do so indeed. Some, somehow it disappeared from... <laughs> yes, now, there I managed. I, I love many, I mean, some of the spiders you work on, many of them actually, I guess, are quite small. I love the fact that you have all these beautiful photos of them. That, that really uh, allows non-specialists like myself to get a, a visceral feel for your work. So thanks very much. That was yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Um, there is, uh, there is some, some of our colleagues are very shy, uh, so I will read to, uh, two uh, questions from the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Sebastian Duterte says, uh, thanks, Tana, for a great and entertaining talk. He says, bees could be perceived as dangerous prey for a spider, yet uh, Tomisidi specialized on them without relying on the web. They're ambush predators. Mm -hmm. Do you have any hints on how they have evolved to successfully target these types of prey, super fast acting venom, perhaps? And he also says that he's not shy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for Sebastian for that question. Yes, uh, Tommy says, this is the genus Mizumena, which is actually capturing the typically bees on the flowers. Uh, I have to say that this is not a really specialist because uh, when we have, or literature shows actually that these spiders feed on several different prey types, which includes even flies, butterflies and so on. The way how they manage to catch such a big prey compared to them, I have to say they it's mainly the females which have a big bodies during the adulthood. So they are about half size of the large bee, which could be even the bumblebee. And I think it's the really the venom that actually acts very fastly. And that's how they can actually prevent, because I mean, the bumblebee or bee is very large. So it could simply fly away with the spider when it's captured. But the, so the venom must act very fastly to prevent this, uh, this uh, escape by the prey. Unfortunately, nobody has studied this yet. So Mizumena is kind of out of focus of any, of any arachnologist that would be interested in venom. Well, after your talk, I'm sure that this audience are all cannot wait to go work on spiders. I feel that itch myself. Another person <laughs> who says uh, they are not shy at all, Julia Sonkali asks, do all spider-eating spiders have enlarged front legs? Is this an adaptation to their prey type? Uh, yes, uh, no, actually. Uh, there are about 20 different spider species which occur in the world, which we know that they are specialized. And about half of them have really enlarged uh, forelegs. But this is rather an exception. What they do have in common is a very thick cuticle. They have cuticle because spider, I mean, the spider prey could actually bite. So they could counterattack. So mm. they really have very thick cuticle, mainly on the whole bodies, mainly on the prosoma. So it works as an armor. Oh, that's interesting. 
But other like salty seed, there is a salt, a very famous salty seed of the genus Portia, which is an ant, uh, which is a spider eating one, and they do not have large or uh, enlarged forelegs. It would be interesting to see if 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 a uh, spider eating spider gets bitten by its venomous prey, whether if if they be are able to bite through the cuticle, whether that spider has an enhanced resistance to venom. Like when you look in vertebrates. Venom resistance of snake eating mammals such as or possums or honey badgers, you know, they have molecular adaptations to, to increase their resistance against bites. But if you look at, for instance, a venomous snake eating birds, if I'm not mistaken, they don't have that. They just have chemical, they sorry, they have mechanical defense, either a thick layer of feathers mm -hmm. or thick skin on their bare legs. Uh, but if they do get bitten successfully, they are essentially in trouble. So it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, uh, I mean, from the observation that we did in the lab, it happened several times that the spider eating spider has been killed by the prey. And mm -hmm. obviously this was thanks to probably the venom. So it seems they do, they do not have a resistance. But again, it could be certain populations, they could have some resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid that it would not be easy to evolve such a resistance because the spider eating spider basically feed on different types of spiders. It's not a single type of prey. I mean, like one species or one mm -hmm. genus. Mm -hmm. It's several genera from several yeah. families. Mm -hmm. And I think the resistance would be difficult to evolve under such conditions. Interesting. Uh, Keith, uh, you have a question? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so I, I read your work every day. I was struggling to think of a question. <laughs> um, I do a lot of work with generalist specialist spider stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, I had two questions, but I'll start with the, the one that probably follows on the topic you're on about there, about the venom resistance. So I found at looking at some species of generalists that their venom, when tested on themselves, like the same mm -hmm. species, that it's generally ineffective. And I was trying to determine if it's that they have resistance or it's just that they don't evolve venom to kill their own species. Although that kind of contradicts the idea that some species are cannibalistic or even like the black widows, female eating male and mm -hmm. stuff. I was wondering if you have any idea what it could be. It's the Laranoides, it's a RNA web or weaver species I'm talking about in particular. Mm -hmm. So in general, I mean, we have been collecting information on the spray of the different spider species for many years. And what we see is that basically Cannibalism is very frequent in almost in many many different genera. Basically, mm -hmm. it's not only the cannibalism among mates, like the female eating male or male fe eating yeah. the females, but also among juveniles. Actually, in fact, most of the cannibalism happens at very early stage, like the first or the second instar before the dispersal of spiders. So I don't think they, they there is any resistance evolved because the cannibalism is really frequent. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's because of the, the juvenile stage in particular? So that like that there's no time, any of them that might have had a, a chance maybe would, they're all the same size. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think the time is very short for the spider. Yeah, you know, so there wouldn't be Typically time a spider lives less than one year. I mean, for yeah. example, in temperate Europe, the whole cycle from the egg, basically until the adulthood, last or at maximum one year or something like that. And some species have even a shorter life cycle, like six months or something like that. So I don't mm. think there is enough time to evolve any resistance. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But th thanks for confirming my thoughts there. And great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Keith. Good question. Um, I, I Since I run the show, I want to ask one more question before I let you go, because who knows if we will ever discuss this again. Given that in the specialists you get multiple changes, you get smaller ve ve venom volumes, you get uh, less complex venom, you get, as you mentioned in your introduction, also probably metabolic slash enzymatic adaptations so that the diet from which they can sustain nutrients becomes more narrow. Do you think that specialization in these spiders is a one-way street? Uh, most likely, but we already have evidence <laughs> that it can reverse to generalism. And we have evidence from the Canary Islands visitor species which feed on wood lice. 
these are specialists, at least. This is a very huge, uh, um, highly diversity of genus. It has about 200 species. And we clearly see, based on some phylogenetic analysis, that there are specialists that later probably rever reverted to generalism. So they were able to adapt to a different types of prey. So it's not a, like a cul-de-sac or actually blind way for the evolution, but it seems that some spiders can actually change. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually kind of has been testing this. Uh, we, this the, if you remember the first video when I showed this sterile spider were catching ants. So it's an ant-eating spider. And we did see that it has metabolic adaptation. Is that we have all types of adaptation which are very effective against ants. And we tried to actually feed the spiders only on flies. There is nothing is available from the very first instar only flies. So they had to switch and they ate the flies, but only I think 1% of the individuals, something like five individuals out of 200 were able to basically develop to the adulthood. So great majority died, but few of them were able to make it and they were even able to reproduce. Interesting. It would be interesting to see if that has repercussions for their venom composition. If Yes, that would be very... <laughs> Even the metabolic cost of it all. Yeah. Uh, so this is the cool thing. Every interesting finding raises a million interesting directions to explore. Stano, if you don't mind, the last question, uh, Elia Diego uh, mm -hmm. uh, writes in the chat, uh, your work is very interesting. The differences between species of specialist spiders is very clear. I'm curious, have you observed differences between males and females? Yes, so yes, we did study it. And basically the picture is very similar. Males, when they become adult, they have reduced glands because they uh, have reduced capture rate. They, for example, in Zodarion spiders with feed on ants, they do not actively catch prey, but they steal the prey for females because obviously they have very little venom they, cannot, they can use. So there are differences, sexual differences in the prey capture and also in venom. But we have not, the problem is that we have not investigated the venom composition of males because the reduced glands have produced very little venom, which is very difficult to analyze. So all our analysis are based on adult big females. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you, Stano, and Joachim as well. Both of your talks were excellent. Um, I'm very happy that you agreed to give these talks. I'm sure everybody will join me in digital clapping, which is weird. Um, I, I'm going to say that we have two interesting speakers for next month as well on what we all know is International Star Wars Day, Wednesday, the 4th of May. Oh, uh, Mike Dumm and Ivan Undheim are going to give uh, their seminars. The titles yet to be announced, which we'll do in a couple of weeks. So uh, you're all welcome to join those seminars as well. I uh, want to thank the audience for joining us. And uh, with that, I uh, say I will close the meeting. Um, I hope that we all will meet at some point in the flesh and we can have a, a beer and talk more. For now, thanks again. Um, everybody, good luck with your research. Stay safe. And I hope to see you uh, in the future. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.